My name is Ashley Ann, and you're watching Studio Q. Studio Q Show, now you know. Hello everyone, it's your girl Quincy and we are doing a Skype Studio Q interview. If you can see and feel my energy bopping through, you know, on YouTube, Facebook Live, wherever this goes, it's because I am interviewing a rock star, people. I don't know if you don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is a rock star. She is a rock star. Her name is Ashley and she is, I mean, Ashley, you have so many titles, okay? You're a wedding planner, you're an interior designer, you're a live streamer, you're a social media genie. I mean, female boss, public speaker, uh, you know, you could be a, a, a model. I mean, come on. What, what, what is that premier title do I introduce you as? Um, entrepreneur and biz builder. Biz builder, <laughs> yeah, the late night biz builder, yes. So I just want to first thank you and welcome you to Studio Q. I so appreciate you accepting the invitation to allow me to interview you. Oh my God, thank you for having me. I'm so excited and I'm so honored. I was like, what? <laughs> Y'all are popping. You get all the hot interviews, all the celebs, all the like, great questionnaires. It's amazing. So I'm super excited to... Uh, have the opportunity to sit with you and to be interviewed by you. Oh, that, that is music to my ears, and you fit right along with that cast of people, okay? So you are among the best. That's why I wanted to interview you. Well, uh, um, first first and foremost, I want to ask you, what is the world according to Ash? I mean, Ash Cat. I mean, just, <laughs> just give me that. <laughs> the world according to me, um, the world according to me, honestly, and not to get all churchy, but this is really what I believe. The world is whatever you want it to be. Um, you know, we're the only beings that God gave free will to. So he gives us the ability to co-create with him whatever it is that we want for ourselves. So as exciting as you want your life to be, as fun as you want it to be, as chaotic as you want it to be, as negative as you want it to be, whatever you want it to be, that's what the world is. So just whatever you want, that's what it is. <laughs> See that I, I hear all kinds of the law of attraction in what you're saying. Uh, you know, just like you said, being a co-creator with God. That's another reason why I wanted to interview you is because the vibrations, baby, the vibrations. Yes, yes, the vibes. <laughs> the story. <laughs> well, I know that you opened your company in 2006. How did you go from you know interior designer and and all of that to a social media? guru genie um okay so it's really interesting um i've always had the gift of business but i did not recognize it as a gift until i was like in my 20s um, and i also have the gift of beautification and i got the gift of hospitality um i got a lot of talents but those are three main things that i got you know that i could really get out here and work so now with and so i love design i love events now i did not realize at the time when i went into interior design and event designer that it was actually um, a big practice in manifestation because you take the idea that someone has in their head, right? And sometimes they don't even know what the idea is. They're just kind of talking to you. It's an image in your head, and then lo and behold, there's a room, and there's 300 people standing in your room or 1,000 people standing in your vision. And you literally took something that you imagined, turned it into a sketch, and then made it into reality. So um, I, I really love doing social events like weddings and birthdays because these are things that people have like really dreamed about for their whole entire lives. And all of a sudden, you make it a reality. And just the joy and the overwhelming appreciation that people feel – was amazing. So when I started my company, I started with $125 in a laptop. I did not have much at all. Uh, blew through my savings, you know, the whole humdrum story like all other um, entrepreneurs. And um, that got a lot of people to start noticing me because, you know, inside of the event industry, people are in and out of business within 18 months on average. Wow. So there are very few of us that actually survive, maintain, and we're able to do it and make a living at it. Um, and so people start coming and asking me questions about business and what they should do and what they should not be doing. And then other people outside of the industry start asking me questions about business. And then I would find out, I'm like, well, don't you have this coach? And aren't you paying somebody like $10,000 to be helping you with this? And don't you have this team of consultants and all this sort of type of stuff? And they'd be like, yeah, I do. But whatever you're telling me 
is actually working. <laughs> um, so that's when I first kind of realized, okay, everyone doesn't necessarily, you're not, you're not just born with the gift of business and the ability to make money and kind of recognize systems and stuff. Um, and I was doing all the stuff. I was taught to be a mass marketer and I started marketing on my social media, um, you know, just kind of throwing stuff out there. And, you know, I did a post. Nothing major really happened. I don't even think I got 10 likes on a girl. I did another one. Got like six or seven. I did another one. It only was maybe a little bit over 20, but somebody inboxed me and said, hey, can you do, do you do birthday parties as well? Yeah, I do birthday parties. You know, <laughs> what, what's your budget, girl? She had like a $25,000 budget for this birthday party. So I was like, of course I'll do your party. I'm already at the venue. Where are you at, right? <laughs> because I literally had been spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, in print, TV commercials, magazines, mailers, pizza boxes. I was on church fans, you know, just doing everything that they had trained me to do Mm -hmm. in school. And I was like, this didn't even cost me anything. I just put it on my Facebook page and I just booked a client, you know, for a $25,000 contract. And that's when my mind really you know, started wanting to know more about social media. And I really, I think that was the first time I recognized the power of it Mm -hmm. and how it gave me the ability to put myself in front of people who didn't even know that I existed before then. And that's what really got me into it. And I started learning and taking classes and I started trial and error and different experiments and, you know, just kind of trusting my instincts and, um, putting together systems that were unconventional and things that people would think would never work. And all of a sudden they started started working, working. rolled with it. And then people noticed it then and they kept asking. And so then about seven years ago, I realized basically I was operating as a consultant and, um, I had two or three other people, and the guys told me, they're like, well, you know it now. You're my unofficial business partner. They said, I don't make any decisions before, you know, without calling you. And I was like, what? So that's when I realized, I was like, okay, I can also have a career as a consultant. And then I started realizing there were so many people who know nothing about social media. You know, they've done wonderful in the brick and mortar world of mm-hmm. business, but they but things were moving over rapidly mm-hmm. to social media and they didn't know how to contact people. They didn't know how to connect with them, how to build a community, how to run ads, how to target them, know any of that stuff. And I was like, well, I know how to do it. And so that's how I started working in the niche of not only a business builder, but social media and using it um, basically to to create targeted audiences and convert people. I I just love that. I just love that, you know, you went to school because, you know, people, she has not just a, 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 you know, undergraduate degree. She has a master's degree. Okay. So she, (laughs) she didn't went to school to know how to do this. And then to me, I feel like you got a PhD on your own. You know, <laughs> through, through, so, through social media. I want to know, going back to the $125 and a laptop, because there's so many people who uh, probably watch you every night on Periscope or, you know, follow you on social media and want to start. They just want to, you know, just start. And you did it with a laptop and $125. Like, what was the thing that kept you going and, and, and allowed you to see that I would have way more than 125 a year from now, you know, what kept you going? Um, honestly, and this is going to sound really serious, really silly, but I like to win. It's like nothing more than that. I'm a person. I like to win. I like to have a plan in my head, set myself a goal and then chase the goal and try to surpass the goal. So that has a lot to do with it. And then I think when you're passionate about something, like I really fell down in my spirit, uh, in my shanana, as the key to be able say, I really felt like this is what I'm put on the planet to do. I can't imagine myself doing anything else, even though I already, you know, I had a career and all of that good stuff. Um, I was working as an analyst. And I just, I was like, this makes me happy. It makes me fulfilled. Even the things about it, I, the things about it that are kind of crappy, I still kind of sort of like them. I'm willing, you know, to deal with it. And so um, that's just the pursuit of wanting to win, wanting to succeed, and wanting to have the ability to literally wake up every morning and love what I do. That's what made me, you know, keep trekking on, keep trying to figure it out. You know, because you don't get knocked down on your butt. All of us do. But you got to be able to get back up and keep, 
pushing. And I think the passion kind of makes all entrepreneurs. I think it. I think all of us are kind of crazy mm-hmm. because who else would put up with that much stuff and keep going back to it? Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's the passion for what you really love that you know gives you the drive to keep going even when, even when you know, in your reality you can't see the vision that's in your heart and your mind, but mm-hmm. you know that is going to materialize on this side eventually, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to keep walking towards it. Eventually it's going to show up. So, yeah. Well, what do you find? Cause you talk to a lot of people, help a lot of people. What do you find is the biggest obstacle for people to start? Their mindset. Mindset. That's the biggest thing. Um, we are too focused in general on what we don't have, uh, that we're unqualified, letting a lot of unqualified people on the sidelines disqualify us. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are afraid to be themselves or walk in their vision or their passion or because they don't understand it, then they're going to tell you what you should do with your money and with your time Mm -hmm. and with your ideas. And a lot of us will fall prey and listen to it or people are afraid, oh, someone's going to talk about me. They're going to make fun of me. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've always been told my whole life that I ain't nothing. I'm never going to be nothing. Um, Even with something as simple as live streaming, I talked to so many people, they're afraid to get in front of the camera. I'm too fat. I'm too black. I got a gap in my teeth. I got, you know, my skin is too bad. My hair is too bad. All all this, like, kind of little crazy, weird, um, irrational thoughts that people Mm -hmm. are having. It's the mindset and just being too focused on what you don't have. Mm -hmm. Instead of, but I do have a mind. I do have a mouth. I do have a phone. I do have ideas. I do have connections. Um, I'm going to meet new people, you know, just really saying, really focusing in on what I do have and let me take that and use that to my advantage and not really be worried about, you know, some negative critique that somebody I don't even know, you know, what they have to think about me or negative critique from somebody that I do know. It doesn't matter. You know, what matters. I'm happy and I'm walking in my truth and I want to do something for myself and create security for myself. In the word wait, in the words of Ashley Ann, are you picking up what she putting down? <laughs> blink, blink, blink. <laughs> She is she is giving, she is feeding y'all. She is feeding y'all. She is inspiring and mot- pick up what she putting down. Where you get all those sayings from, Ashley? Girls are just country. I don't know. Country people, we just we just come up with all kinds of stuff. <laughs> just country. And country people have, we got a way, we have a special way with words in the country. So some of it are things I've heard my whole life. And some of it's just stuff to just, you know, fly out of your mouth. Like, I remember one time I told somebody, I was like, don't test me. I'm fresher than a cucumber in the garden. It's like, what? I was like, I was like you ever have fresh cucumber from the garden? You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love it. Tell about that. <laughs> well, you, you talked you talked about live streaming, and you you are so comfortable live streaming. And I I know you must have did public speaking before, but to me, to sit in front of your phone case or a computer laptop, how did you get comfortable with basically talking to that, knowing that there's people on the other side, but it's really just you in the room. Um, just repetition is where it came from because I even know people who are professional public speakers and they, they still won't do it um, because of, you know, you got the situation with like trolls and um, there's one thing when things are edited, but when you got to deal with stuff live on the spot, right. somebody giving you jabs, a lot of people can't handle it. But um, as far as talking out loud, the very first time I did it, I felt like an idiot. My first broadcast was terrible. And I think I remember saying inside of my broadcast, I was like, this is so stupid. I was like, I feel like an idiot right now because you're speaking out loud, but there's nobody there to talk back to you. Right. It's a very strange phenomenon to sit and talk and there's physically not, there's no audible voice. That you exactly. Can hear. Um, but in, so the repetition and then also because I go into other people's broadcasts, mm-hmm. especially I visit the people who like follow me and stuff like that. So I can learn their voices. I can hear their vernacular, their diction. So it's really strange. So over time, when they're typing comments to you, it's like you can actually hear it because you sound, you know what they sound like now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but just repetition, girl, because you do. You feel crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, but you know, if you if you come in, it, it looks like you've been doing it, you know, your whole life. You know, but you hear you hear what she putting down. Practice, people. Practice. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Now you've helped. I think I, I, maybe like fifty five hundred now, but you said forty four hundred small businesses. How do you yes. enable them to reach their goals and and leverage their social social media platforms? You know, and, and what does it feel like to help so many people? You know. Uh um, how do I help leverage is I teach them targeting. Mm -hmm. I'm a big targeter. Um, and my master's program was amazing. My entrepreneurial um, professors were amazing and incredible. Um, but I think the thing that a lot of universities and colleges are dealing with right now, social media is so new. There's not really a textbook on it. There's not really a course on it. So a lot of us, I had to get out and handle this stuff out on my own. And, you know, 11 years ago when I started, there weren't people like me sitting in front of a camera saying, yeah, you know, put one plus two, there's going to get three, go down the road, do the hokey pokey, you know, <laughs> back a lot of time, make a family, and you're going to get there. <laughs> want anybody to kind of give you a formula to say, this is what works. Um, so I give them formulas. I help them create the proper infrastructure, mm -hmm. and I teach them how to become content marketers and add value instead of trying to sell to people mm -hmm. and how to actually build a relationship. Um, and then in between there, you know, you make indirect sales and direct sales and those sorts of types of things. And this is how you can get traffic, you know, into your physical location. This is how you can get somebody to go to your online boutique. It's how you get somebody to, you know, buy your bundles or wear your dress or come and get your jewelry or, you know, buy your meal plan or come through your weight loss program or go and buy a house from you or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and it feels amazing i'm so proud to be a part of so many people's success yeah. um it's a, it's unreal and i love it when people send me emails and dms and they're like you know you helped me get my house out of foreclosure i've been in business for three years and haven't made any money i've been trying to make money online for five years and made a dollar you know before i met you um, i have a client right now she's just kicking but she's had several coaches before she got to me and, um, you know, she had been trying for years. And she told me, you know, literally in the past nine months, she's made more money than she's ever made in her life. And she's cleared. She, she, she's going to make about $500,000 this year. Not a doubt um, within my mind. So I, so I, love it. I, I, I need people around me to succeed the way that I need air to breathe. Mm. I, really, I really need it. I thrive off of it. And I get so excited seeing other people win it's like it really does something for me so yeah, yeah. And, and that's what i feel from you i feel from you i feel like you know that is that is part of your success that you want other people to succeed and i love that you love that i just love that you love that you know what i mean because that, that we need more of that we need more people who are not just winning themselves but want other people to win you know yeah it's a, it's a mindset thing. Um, if you come from a place of lack, you're going to always feel like you have to dim somebody else's light or if someone else is shining that for somehow that's taking something away from you. Mm -hmm. But when you are really in the mind frame of abundance and that there's more than enough for all of us, and every time I create some good energy, because whatever, whatever we do to other people, it's already done to us. So if I'm doing good to you and for you and I'm creating good energy and I'm able to help other people, guess what? I'm doing nothing more than bringing back good energy and success and power and amazingness to myself in the long run. And because of that, if I can help somebody and then they say, well, you need to go and see this girl because this is who helped me. And then they don't tell one person, they tell 10 people. Yeah. All of us are winning because there's more than enough for everyone. And I really believe that. I don't think that anyone has to you know, be dimmed or smothered or suffocated in order for new life or new people to come onto the scene and succeed. Mm hmm Girl, you preach it this morning. You preach it. <laughs> <laughs> this afternoon, this over this way. Um, well, you can send your time. <laughs> I know, that's right. <laughs> donate. We have a donate button underneath. <laughs> Um, a lack of systems. 
Um, but just, that's the biggest thing is a lack of systems for me. And this is my mindset. I feel like it's a lot easier to make, you know, a few dollars over and over and over and over and over again, instead of me chasing one large, you know, million dollar account or $2 million accounts. And, um, there's nothing wrong because it only takes one and sometimes a million dollar or 2.5 million or something huge is going to fall in your lap. But I think it's a lack of, they don't actually have a system put in place of, this is how I meet people. Now, what do I do with the people once I meet them? What do I want the people to do with them? And a lot of small business owners don't even have goals. I ask them, well, what's your, what's your revenue goals? How much do you want to make from Instagram? How much do you want to make from your live stream? How much do you want to make from Periscope? And they look at me like deers in headlights. They've never really thought about it. Um, you know, they don't, they're not even really aware of what they're spending right now <laughs> to try and make money. They don't really, a lot of people have no idea if they're profitable or not. Um, so I would say the lack of systems and goals is probably the biggest thing. Um, and people don't realize how important that infrastructure is because that's how you start to make the sleep money when you have infrastructure that's in place. Okay. Okay. What are some things that, uh, somebody watching right now, you know, who's, following you or just discovering you uh, that they can do to immediately take advantage of their social media, you know? Um, if you're not afraid, live streaming is your friend because it's just like going to a party and meeting people face to face. So you can build a no like and trust factor like 10 times faster. It's like on steroids mm -hmm. and Nobody is going to buy anything from you if they do not like you and if they don't trust you. But if they know, like, and trust you, they will whip out that card and then spend some money with you. Um, the second thing, switch over to content. Stop being so salesy. Really, um, I, I call it the food chain. We got to figure out where we are in the food chain, right? There are very few products, especially here in America, that are consumed independently. So if I'm a slice of bread, I don't know anybody that just eats a slice of bread. Now, people will take bread and they put it in a toaster and they'll put butter on it. They make bread into peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They'll make a turkey sandwich, a ham sandwich with it. Uh, you know, they take breads and they put it in casseroles. There are all these different things that happen with the bread. So if I know that I'm a slice of bread and I know that people like to make sandwiches or eat toast with me, then I need to reach out to other people who have complementary products and services to mine. So if I'm the bread, then I may work. I may reach out to someone who does sliced turkey and ham and bacons and meats. And then I may reach out to somebody else who does condiments. And now I'm going to reach out to the peanut butter and jelly people and I'm going to reach out to the butter people. Right. And we're going to we're going to and I'm going to start telling you all the different things you can do with my bread. And by the way, you can do this, you know, with um, Studio Q butter and have the most amazing coat you've ever had in life. Right. So now introducing each other to one another's audience and we're starting to grow but really figuring out who is complementary to you or what is complementary to you and starting to show people the value and educating them mm -hmm. so that they go i do need your product and they come and they buy it from you. gotcha gotcha y'all picking up what she putting down she is giving y'all some free egg drops i got all my lingo all my lingo from Ashley. Yes. <laughs> so I want to uh, transition a little bit because, you know, you have been so transparent with your real life. So, I, you know, the like, no trust factor is very deep with you. You've been, I mean, you have talked about the four surgeries that you had on your, on your spine and, and, you know, being in an abusive relationship and, and saying, hey, I'm going to go eat at my mama and daddy's house because I can't afford groceries at this point in my life. Like, what helped you to overcome all those obstacles? First question. Second question, how do you deal with people when they come to you with petty excuses for why they can't when you've been through so much? <laughs> uh, um, the first thing to help me deal with the obstacles, again, it goes back to the mindset. Um, there was a point in my life I was so poor and I don't mean like financially poor. I was very poor in mindset. Mm -hmm. I, I had not really accepted and realized, and I truly believe this 80% of the things that are happening inside of our lives, they're things that we have created. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what happens to you. 
It is how you react to what happens to you, and you can choose to let that elevate you or diminish you. And depending on how you speak to it and the way that you act towards it, it is going to determine what else comes into your life from it. So I was very poor in my mindset because I didn't understand that concept at that time, and I did not realize that I really had a great deal of power. Like All of us have power. We can manifest whatever we want to, but I hadn't tapped into it yet. And I had surrounded myself with users. I had surrounded myself with takers. I had surrounded myself with abusers, and I was so, um, if I'm honest, I was so worried about what other people thought about me. And because I was worried about what other people thought about me, I was a liar. Now, I wasn't the type of person to go and lie about, I have this much, or I, I don't have this, or I don't have that. It wasn't that I lied about those things, but I was lying about my emotional state. And I was lying, you know, I didn't want people to know I was in an abusive relationship. And I didn't want people to know that my ex-husband would leave sometimes for three or four nights at a time and not come home, right? And I would go out, I put on my makeup, I put on my face. And the girl, I even had nerve enough to be there for other people and advising them and praying for them. But I'm out here, you know, lying and pretending everything is okay and trying to hide what's really going on in the background of my life because I've always, um, I am a strong woman and a lot of people see me as strong and assertive. And so I was like, it's embarrassing. You know, even when I was dating, I never even let a dude cheat on me when I was dating. And now I'm married to a man who's cheating on me, hitting me, you know, I'm basically living in hell. So it was a lot for me. And I was, um, I was trying to mask it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to change things when you're trying to hide things and you won't acknowledge it. So I was continuing to bring all of that negativity and trash into my life. So I was super poor in mindset. And once I said, enough is enough. What was the I day, was Ashley? What was the moment? What was the day? What was the moment that, that you said no more and things changed? And it was, um, and it was a combination of things. Like literally it was probably one of the toughest weeks in my life. Um, I had gone to the doctor and they told me, you know, basically I need to prepare to be in a wheelchair. My spine was deteriorating at a rapid rate. I had a very bad business deal and somebody had taken about $25,000 for me, which is crazy now because I'm in the position I literally make that in a day now. But before, you know, that was enough yeah. to put me out of business to take me out. I wasn't, I, I wasn't killing it the way I'm killing it now. Um, and then... Um, you know, my ex-husband's mistress at the time had recently contacted me because she thought I was the side chick. She thought I was the other woman, honey. She called wow. me. Wow. No, why? Right? So, so I'm dealing with all of this stuff, and I remember going to the doctor's office alone. I was by myself, and I had to call my parents. I just broke down the stream and she was like, oh, my God, you know, you just told me the worst news. And I'm like, the man I'm married to is not even here to support me but I've supported this person through everything that they've been through. And he had been through a lot. And I'm always there for him. And the the girl that was my so-called best friend at the time, she's, she's not here with me. What is going on in my life that I have so many people around me that when I'm in need, mm. they're not here? Mm. That was what did it for me. And I was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to be happy. Yeah. And I want people who will love me as much as I love them. Yes, yes. I am so glad that that moment happened for you to turn your life around, you know, because <laughs> it not only helped you, it's helping all of us who's watching you. You know what I mean? Because you've got to become who you are right now, but you had to go through that. What's, what's, it, the, what's the biggest lesson you learned from that time? Um, the biggest lesson that I learned from that time Hmm, because I learned so many lessons. Um, if I had to pick one, if I had to pick one, when people show me who they are, believe it. Because mm. they were trying on you. Yeah, because when I look back on it, there were all these signs and all these stuff that people would do and you know I would just let it slide and I think a lot of times people think it has to be something big and great and catastrophic that happens but honestly like disrespect and devaluation it's very systematic and it's a series of very small events and there are things that we continue to allow in our lives and I had to you know just one like why am I even allowing this you know 
um, what, what, what is going on with me that I'm basically willing to be a trash can mm-hmm. to some people. And so that, so yeah, it was, it was really a lot of that. So paying attention and even when somebody shows you something, even if it's small, like, no, that is the truth. That's the reality. And if they act that way with something small, they're going to act that way with something large. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And when people come to you with excuses that don't even meet the threshold <laughs> of what you've been through, what goes through your mind and how do you still find a way to help them? <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know. Sometimes I was like, you ain't the client for me. And I told people that. I said, you're not for me. And they say, well, I'm like, because you don't want it. You're full of excuses. Um, you know, I have a friend that I'm working with right now, and she is going through cancer again, but yet she still works and she keeps her business together. And I tell people, you cannot let a temporary emotion or situation um, affect you permanently. We're not going to make decisions based off of what's happening temporarily. You're not going to make a permanent decision based off of what's going on in your life right now temporarily. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just tell them, like, because if you come to me and you go, oh, you know, I got a headache. I can't do this. Okay, girl. Well, <laughs> my spine broke it and I feel able to work. Yeah. And then they go, oh, so shut up. Get either, get the, either crap or get off the pot. I don't have time for it. If you really, really want it. You have got to come with it because you got to realize in the world you're competing against people like me. You're competing against people like my friend who has cancer. You're competing against people. We are relentless in our pursuit. And we will we take any health issue, we take emotional issues, we take family issues, and we compartmentalize it. We deal with it, but we understand that it's a distraction and we don't let it stop us. We have our eyes on the prize and we want it. And I'm going to come eat your lunch. I'll eat your baby lunch. i eat your grandma's lunch. I'm going to come eat y'all dinner. Then I'm going to look in your face and be like, uh, I did it. What you going to do? <laughs> you, you can be, you're competing against people in the yeah. world like me. You know, we have morals and values and we're not going to do anything that's disrespectful, but we're going to do everything that we can in our power to get what we want to win. We do not quit. And it doesn't matter how many times we get knocked down, doesn't matter what our health issue is, doesn't matter what our emotional state is, we know at the end of the day, I still have a mission to complete. And until you really want to succeed, you know, where nothing until it's the point where literally nothing is going to stop you and you really want it just as bad as you want to breathe. You really want it just as bad, you know, as you want love. You really want it just as bad as you want peace. You really want it just as bad as you want abundance. You want it just as bad as anything that you've ever wanted badly in your life. You're not going to win because you're going to take any little, you're going to take any little thing and use it as an excuse to bow out. And, you know, you weak sauce and maybe you not cut out, you know? She said weak sauce. Weak sauce. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I want to know why do you give such uh, massive amounts of free advice every night online? Um... But because it goes back into that thing that I really believe, the more whatever I'm doing into others is already done into me. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, if I can keep somebody from having to struggle the way that I had to struggle, if I can keep someone from making the same mistakes that I've made, if I can keep someone from losing as much money as I've lost, um, then congratulations for me and for them. And I, and honestly, there's a, um, there's a lack of information inside of our community. Mm. So, and I can talk to people in a language that they can understand and not use all the jargon, jargon and the marketing terminology. If I can get on and empower somebody and show you, this is how you can start to create whatever you want to from exactly where you are right now. Mm-hmm. That's going to, better for us as a whole. Um, there's a there's a serious economic disparity. And if you look at the charts, every single race and every single nationality and every single culture's income has risen in the United States except for African Americans. When we got to the 1980s, we flatlined. So everyone else is doing this and we're doing this. And it comes from a lack of information, right? And even if you go back to the word, right, tell my people perish for a lack of knowledge. So if I can get out here and I can help and I can teach and I can open up people's eyes and show them different opportunities, that's better for us all as a whole. And in return, what God has done 
he's allowed it to bless my business because it helps me to pick up more clients. And I'm never worried about the free information that I'm giving out because I tell my clients all the time, you think this free 99 is where it's at. My pay 99 is everything. I'm a plethora of information. I've been, I'm kind of like a dinosaur now. I've been in business for 11 years. So I don't know everything, but I know a lot of things, honey. And I'm always learning. I'm always evolving. I'm always trying new things. Um, so that's, you know, that's not a worry to me. You know, some people, they're so tight with their information because honestly, that's all they know. And a lot of these so-called gurus, I'm not trying to be shady or anything, you know, they're just going and Googling information. They can't really get in depth about it. They can't really show you how to do things. They don't really know how to advise you if you make a wrong step or, you know, you get an error. So I'm not really worried about it because I have the actual experience to back it up. And as my daddy would say, experience is your greatest teacher. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, your daddy is right. Your daddy is right. <laughs> what, do you, is. what do you think one of the most effective ways to create wealth is? One of the most effective ways to create wealth, I can, and I can only give you one. Oh, geez. Okay, um, it's kind of like a cheater answer. You know the truth? Diversification. <laughs> I mean, it's probably it's the right one. You creating it, so I'm gonna listen to whatever you say. <laughs> right now, right now, we want diversification. Um, you know, just not putting all your eggs in one basket. And once you get one business up and running, um, if there are other things that you can invest in, you know, that are good, sound investments, if there are other things that you can spring off of that, creating the multiple streams of revenue. Um, everybody needs everybody needs them. Even as much as I love social media and I love it, you know, it, as much as everything blows up, Eventually, it has to deflate, right? Eventually, there's going to be a boom. And you don't want, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, no, you learn how to build your business online and you learn how to build your business offline. You got to have both skill sets. Um, and then if you get your money up enough, then I tell you to go and get some real estate. I have, I don't know one person that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars that doesn't own real estate. Gotcha. I don't know one of them that does not own real estate. Um, you know, God ain't making no more land, so. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think one of the biggest myths about social media is? Um, I think the biggest myth that I hear about social media, people think, um, they think that there's no money there. And I'm not really sure why they think that. They think that no one is spending money on social media. They think it's a waste of time and it's uh, it's really silly, you know, and it's just a bunch of people saying, hey, and hashtag it. And it's because they don't understand that social media helps us develop relationships. They don't understand that 70% of clients are going to your social media pages even before they go to your website, before they come to your restaurant, before they pick up a phone and even call you. They're going to check you out on social media. Um, and so I think, you know, because because they don't understand it. Like, you know, I've kind of grown up with it. I remember I got my Facebook page when I was in college. Um, and before that, when I was in high school, MySpace and Black Planet were what was popping. And I had a Black Planet and I had a MySpace page. Um, and so I've grown up with it. So I, I understand it a little bit more. But I can see how maybe someone who is over the age of 45 and those are the people who are honestly pretty much currently in power and hold a lot of the businesses and, and you know, are in control of power and inspiration and all that good stuff. I can see why they don't understand it because they, they don't get it. All they see is a bunch of pictures, a bunch of codes, you know, that this guy is silly right. thing. Um, but they don't realize it's really about building strong connections and um, maintaining relationships with people. That's what I love that, you know, you really hone in on is how it's about relationships. That's what that's re what you're really doing. You know, it's a different way of doing it, but you got to build relationships. And I feel like that's what you do every night. That's what you're doing on all your different platforms. People they do know, like, and trust you because they get to see you and get information from you on a consistent basis, you know? So I just love that. Why do you think Facebook ads get the most traffic? Why? I know you, it's not why do you think you know because that's what you teach. 
Yeah, no, I love Facebook. I think everybody needs to learn Facebook. Right now, Facebook is still the biggest and the baddest. They just are. Um, and then they purchased Instagram a few years ago. So now they, well, Instagram was number two until Snapchat came along with a fury. <laughs> but that, that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. Um, but Facebook has the lowest barrier to entry. If you call up a radio or you call um, a cable network or you call a magazine and you want to run an ad, nobody's going to do anything for you for $10 a day. Right. It just is not going to happen. Um, and the beautiful thing about Facebook, y'all, like when I literally started advertising with them, I only had a budget of $50 a month. I have the, um, I have my little plan saved. Mm -hmm. so I, remember, I remember that was my goal. Spend $50 a month on my Facebook ad. That was my goal, you know, and even and I was able to take that $50 a month though, and it was bringing me in um, two or three solid contracts that were in, that were valued in between $25,000 and $65,000 every single month with $50, right? Um, and, and Facebook ads allows you to target. They have 1.86 billion active users every month. You have 600 million active users on Instagram every month. When you run an ad on Facebook, as long as it's in the correct parameters, it's also going to run on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So I can find people based on their age, their location, what TV shows they like to watch, um, their education, the neighborhoods they live in, their zip code. There are all these different cool factors that you can use to target people. So now instead of you wasting money, you know, just kind of doing a huge blast out because that's what that's what it does when you're when somebody listens to your commercial on the radio. You don't really know if they're interested or not. When somebody sees your commercial on a TV show or in a magazine, you don't really know if they're interested or not. But if I know, let's say for example, um, I sell running shoes. Mm -hmm. Well, I can go in Facebook and I can look up everybody running the upcoming marathons. And I can send out an ad for my running shoes, right? And then I may say, when you buy a pair of shoes tonight, we're also going to send you, you know, a free belt or something. Like there's this little belt that marathon runners wear. Sometimes yeah. they keep everything in. We're going to send you this or a free energy booster or something like that that's popular for them. And that's going to that's gonna get you sales because now I'm only running my ad for my running shoes in front of people who run marathons. Gotcha. And they relentlessly so that's the beautiful thing about facebook ads and that's why people need to learn how to use it even if you own um let's say you own a restaurant mm -hmm. and i want people to come into my restaurant and eat well why do i want to run my ad all over the place no mm -hmm. i can get on facebook i can put in the address of my restaurant or the zip code and say i want this ad to run to everybody within a 15 mile radius of my restaurant and I'm going to run an ad and I'm going to say, um, click the link and get this free coupon code, get this coupon code for a free appetizer. And you got to come in by May 1st or whatever to redeem your appetizer. Guess what? I just generated a whole bunch of walk-in traffic for my restaurant. Just that simple. And I collected their information because I got their name and their email list. So now they're on a list and I can keep emailing you or I can keep running more ads to you if I install a pixel. And I can say, hey, we're having steak night tonight. Hey, we got trivia games tonight. Hey, it's pizza and beer night tonight. Come on in and have a good time, right? So when you really understand it, then, you know, you can put together these systems not only to get new clientele, but to stay in contact with your current customers and create um, amazing experiences for them and, again, continue to build your relationship. Nice. I mean, so you are just a wealth of information. I mean, boom, you got the Facebook, the Instagram, Periscope. You also are a business in real life where you go and deal with actual people, not just the phone <laughs> case, <laughs> you know. So I wonder, who do who does Ashley look up to in business? Who do you look up to and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna, you know, in five years and ten years, I want my stuff to kind of mirror that? Or wh who do you get your advice from? Oh my God, there's so many people. Um, now, as far as advice and person that I admire the most, my daddy. Oh. As cheesy as that sounds, my daddy. Um, he's everything that I've ever seen him attempt. He's excelled at it. And if he didn't excel at it, he learned from it and used it to excel at the next um, task. Um, the greatest sales advice I got came from him. So I teach a lot of people um, about the 10 network. 
um, and using that, using your, using your 10, you know, to really build your network and getting them to work for you and creating a humongous referral source and customer base source. Wait, and what's uh, the 10? I don't know what that is. What's the 10? <laughs> <laughs> I, I give it, I give it a short because it's on my pay 99 side. Oh, okay. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. You can keep it secret. Keep it secret. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a, there's a relevant 10. And okay. you find your relevant 10 and these it goes back into that space in the food chain. Okay. And these are people, y'all can help each other grow your business. And these are people that you build relationships with. And you stop in once a month and you visit with them and you talk to them and y'all put together campaigns. And whenever they know someone that needs whatever it is you offer, guess who they're referring? You. And whenever you know someone that needs what they got, guess who you're referring? Them. Those 10 grow. And also the beautiful thing about the relevant 10, they walk you into new opportunities. They're able to endorse you. So sometimes people that would never want to talk to you or know you or who wouldn't take your phone call, somebody in their relative 10 knows them. They go, oh, I know such and such. You make sure you show up, you know, tonight when we go on wherever, wherever, I'm going to introduce you guys. I'm going to trade phone numbers with y'all. I'm going to send an email and hook y'all up. So now all of a sudden these other people feel comfortable with you and doing business with you because somebody that they know, like, and trust has endorsed you and said that you're okay. Gotcha. Um, so, gotcha. Uh, yeah, so my daddy, he always has good advice. And sometimes he gets on my nerves because he's like a devil's advocate. And I'll say, this is the idea I have or this is what I want to do. And he'll start asking me all these questions. I'm like, why do you got to be a dream crusher? And he's like, I'm not trying to be a dream crusher. I just want you to, you know, be aware of all the other things that can happen. And I want to know, have you thought about this? What's your plan in place for that? Um, so my daddy, believe it or not, is number one, and he's helped me tremendously, and he's supported me tremendously in my career. And he, um, when I wanted to leave my corporate job, he was the one that pushed me and encouraged me to do it because I was very afraid to leave. And he said, you got to go out and try. God doesn't give you this many opportunities to do what you really want in your life. And he's like, if you don't, you'll always regret it. But he told me, he said, you're good. He said, you're great at what you do. When it came to events, he was, he was like, you can do it. He was like, I know that you can. And I was like, well, what if I fail? He said, well, then you just go back and get a job. He said, it's called experience. He's like, don't you have two degrees? I was like, yeah. You, you know, you said, go back and get a job, girl. I was like, okay. What a, ble- what a blessing to have such an awesome, awesome dad, because most parents would tell their kids the opposite. You know, you better stay at that job, you know. And that's what my mama did. She said, don't you leave that job. <laughs> and my mama loves me, and she definitely has been a support. She helps me with my business. Even even stuff as simple when I, when I just work myself down to the bones, girl, I'm too tired. My mama will give me and put me in the car and take me wherever I need to go. She'll come over here and help me hammer out last minute work. So she's always supported me, but she was afraid because she didn't want me to get out there and fail and be destitute and, you know, fall on my face because she knew what I was doing. And, and you um, are a baby. <laughs> yeah. And, and for a long time inside of our culture, we were taught to survive and not to strive. You know, you get, you grow up, you get a good job, you don't do drugs, you stay out of jail, you know, you pay your taxes, and you be black and die. <laughs> for a long time right not yeah. no you can have all of this stuff and create you know this all of these things and um you know even you know a lot of um a lot of us sometimes we feel like it's almost impossible to generate the amount of revenue or to see see success for ourselves on an independent level because a lot of us feel like unless you're like a celebrity or an athlete or actor or actress or singer or something like that well there's no way you know that you can have this amount of money or even if you look at our really prominent celebrities then you have all these people buying into all of this illuminati stuff so i'm I'm like so you're telling me every black person in hollywood that is successful has sold their soul to the devil there so you're saying we're incapable of attacking this type of success yeah. unless we partner with the devil. You know, even that foolish, you know, that yeah. type of foolish mindset. So, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> so right. yeah. Yeah, and yes. all the celebrities weren't celebrities before they were celebrities, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. you're, you're, so you're just going to demean our culture as a whole. The only way we can come up, we got to go sell our souls to the devil. No. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> Well, you know so much now. What would you tell your younger self? What would I tell my younger self? Um, You have dominion and power over everything around you. Mm -hmm. Don't sweat it. 
don't do, don't sweat it. Don't let people mistreat you. Don't let people misuse you. And, you know, I may have a different mindset about this when I get older in life, but now at, at this point and for the past few years, I'm not, I believe in mutually beneficial relationships. Mm-hmm. I, and, and as much as I want to give and sow into other people, if they don't want to give and sow into me in the same way, or it's not something where we're collectively benefiting, I don't think that I need to be around it. Yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with no, fair change. Ain't no robbery. Reciprocity. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I'm, I'm with it. I'm for it. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a healthy you, way of thinking anyway, you know, to me. Because you yeah. always, if you have to get from your overflow anyway, and, and then if you're not getting anything back, you'll be running around here dry. So that's but, it, but that's a lot of us. We're given and we're running around here dry, just like you said, and we're conditioned. And we're taught that there's something wrong with expecting something back. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and, it, and you know, that is, that's what they teach us. Mm-hmm. Oh, you don't like, and I'll put it like this. Like if I buy you a birthday gift, I'm not buying you a birthday gift because I expect you to buy a birthday gift back for me. Mm-hmm. I bought you a birthday gift though, because you're my friend and I care about you. And I want to show you that I appreciate you and I'm happy you were born on this day, right? I want somebody to appreciate me and value me in the same way. So it may not be a birthday gift, but it may be you being a support when I need a shoulder to cry on. Mm-hmm. It may, may be, you know, um, coming and helping me out. I had so many of my friends and family when I couldn't afford a staff, they would come and they would work my events for me for free so that I could pull them off. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's having, you know, great people in your life who will support you just as much as you're supporting them. And those are the same friends and family. You know, if they needed something and I had it, okay, I'm going to spot you with you, then you don't even have to worry about paying it back. It's the same friends and family. I help you put together your pages. It's the same friends and family. Girl, he did what to you? Come on, with the going to rock, right? <laughs> that is the same type of thing. So um, just, be, you know, not putting yourself in a position where people are always pulling from you. And when you need something, there's not anybody there to support you back. Because eventually we all have to have somebody pour into us as well. Oh, yeah. And and going back to that moment that you had when you looked around and it was just you. It was yeah. just you. I think, you know, God was trying to tell you something. So I'm glad that you still carry that with you. You know, yeah. you know, uh, what is the lesson in business that took you the longest to learn? Ooh, um, trust my instincts. That's what took me the longest to learn. Every time I went against my instincts or I allowed fear to creep in, it always exploded in my face. Mm. <laughs> Every single time. There's not a time. And sometimes, y'all, there's some days. You don't have to have a logical explanation for it. There are some opportunities that people be like, what, you didn't take that opportunity? You're crazy. I just knew it wasn't right. And then down the road, all of this stuff would come out about it. And then they'd be like, ooh, you dodged a bullet. And I'd be like, yeah. And anytime I went against that instinct and I went towards it, you know, maybe because it was logical to do, always backfired. I always ended up with the short end of the stick, left out the cold. I always, you know, ended up, you know, maybe in some debt behind it, having to do all this damage control, having to give up an excessive amount of time, ended up with my feelings hurt, all that kind of sort of stuff. So just trust in your instincts. And I think it's so many of us in business, we don't trust our instincts, but they're there for a reason. And they're to guide us to the right people, the right direction, you know, the right opportunity, uh, putting together the right structure, the right deal, the right product, all of that. Oh, yeah. And I think women, I think women suffer from that more than anybody, not trusting yeah. their instincts. So that's a good one. You recently said, don't spend too much time focused on what other people are doing. Instead, try to be a better version of yourself every day and improve from past mistakes. How do you apply that in your life? Um, that's literally what I do every day. Um, I'm not worried. Now, there's this thing called a SWOT analysis, right? And when you do a SWOT analysis, you have to take an honest look at the at the current marketplace. And you have to see who are your competitors or who are people who are offering products or services similar to what you offer at, right? Because we got to make sure I'm on the same price point or I have the same level of quality or I have a superior quality or a lower price point, you know, all this kind of stuff. Kind of like if you look at the fast food restaurants, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody came up with a four for four, right? Wait, it was five for four dollars first, and then everybody else adapted, and somebody else was four for four for four. And now everybody had some version of a four for four. That is right? true. That, yeah. Right. So so you gotta be aware of 
of what's going on in the in the in in the marketplace. However, you cannot become consumed with other people. And I see a lot of people like even something silly. You know, I tell them, why is your Instagram page on private? But that's, that's just gonna be looking at it, and I don't want them stealing my ideas and knowing what I'm doing. So you're telling me you're missing the opportunity to pick up anywhere from five hundred to a thousand new clients because you worry about one person. Mm. Preach. You're you're the creator, so you're always gonna have a new idea. You're always gonna have a new invention. And guess what? Imitation is the best form of flattery. It is. So I need, so I need, so I need you to get out here and be worried about. Yourself, where you see people, what are they selling? What's in their store? What type of customers they got? Who they call? Where they get this loan for? When they get that new car? Being so obsessed with other people and what they're doing is taking away time and energy from you to be obsessed. And you need to be worried about how am I going to get a new car? How am I going to get new clients? How am I going to increase my clientele? What new opportunity do I have? Can I get on this radio? Can I get on the show? Who's going to help me get to where I'm trying to go right now? Well, what can I give to those people in exchange for that? Um, just really trying to focus on yourself. And then I like to have a little come to Jesus meetings uh, periodically, at least once or twice a month. I'm having them. Okay. What, what, what did I do well in my life? Okay. <laughs> what did I do that was not so well? Because I need to improve that. And what do I just need to stop and I ever do again, right? <laughs> and, and really try, really trying to work on that. So, yeah. yeah, literally every day I have my little goal list. I know what I want to do. I have a little come to Jesus meetings once or twice a month. I write down, you know, some things that are going to help me become a better person in that aspect. And I just go for it. And I put my head down and I work. I'm not mm -hmm. looking at you or them or, you know, him or her. I don't care what you got going on. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to look back. I'm running my race, and I can only look towards the finish line. And when you look back, that's when you start stumbling over your feet. When you look back, that's when other people come and catch you. When you look back, right, that's when all of a sudden you spend so much time looking back, you find yourself at the end of the pack. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I can do is look forward, focus on where I'm trying to go to, and, you know, like I said, quarterly, you do your little SWOT analysis, figure out what's going on in the market and say, okay, I may need to pick that up or I may need to leave it along and keep it pushing. Yes. But get out of people's business. And if, they <laughs> and if they want to be in your business, let them be in your business yeah. because, because that's distracting them from their business. So fine. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, you say you have a manifestation challenge that starts May 1st. Can you tell yeah. me what that's about? And I'm how so people excited. can get down with that. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Um, so it's a 21-day manifestation challenge. And there are a lot of people um, that are you know, always asking me, they're like, how does this happen for you? They're like, you got like the great hookup with God or something? I'm like, no, I got the same hookup everybody else has. Um, but it's really about teaching you, first of all, identifying what your purpose is. Because there's a lot of us wandering around. We, we know that there's more. We know there's something else, but we're really not sure what we're supposed to be doing, it, how, what it is. So what's your purpose? How do you operate in it? Then also identifying what you want in life. It is amazing. If you start asking people what do they want in life, they will stare at you. Mm. And we just going to be blinking at each other because they really don't know. Right? Wow. People will put things on you and tell you, oh, you should do this. You should do that. You should become this. You should go there. You should dump him. You should stay with him. You, you know, they put all these things on you, their ideas for your life. But a lot of us don't know what we really want in life. So really teaching you, what do I want in life? And now that I know what I want in life, how do I get it? So getting the mindset right, the proper prayers, um, praying for the right things, using affirmations that actually work so you can really start to see the life that you want and all of the change. So you're going to give them the secrets to how you to manifest the things within your life. Yeah, I yeah. Love that. I love that. So May 1st, what, do they need to do something? Uh, go somewhere? Yeah. Click on something? I know I should, I should have made a bit link for it, but I didn't. Um, but if you go to my, if you follow me on Periscope, Twitter, or Instagram, I have a little thing. It's called it's Linktree, www.linktree forward slash King Ashley Ann. Click on it, and there's a button that says 21 Day Manifestation Challenge. And it starts May 1st, so you need to try and get in that thing by the end of this month, because once the first hits, can't nobody else get in. 
And uh, every day, literally for 21 days, I'll pop it in the group. We'll talk. I give an assignment. There are different worksheets, activities, challenges, stuff like that. And it's amazing. And people really do get results, and their life really starts changing. So it's, it's crazy, and it's really cool to witness. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I, I want to get your uh, expertise on the Shea Moisture blow up uh, that <laughs> just recently <laughs> happened. What 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 would you have advised them to do? What are your feelings about it as a as a as a woman of color? I mean, it, it blew up on Twitter because of the ad featuring these white <laughs> women and just turned everybody off. They did the apology, but your thoughts. Okay, so first of all, I don't believe that Shea Moisture had any ill intentions at all. Um, I don't feel that they, you know, were trying to devalue their core audience. I don't feel that they were trying to devalue black women. Um, I definitely know that they didn't want, you know, the overtone that happened to happen. I think they are simply doing what all businesses do. You get to a point, you grow, and you want to meet a new base. Well, not even a new base. I'll say you want to you want to get in contact with a new demographic and let them know about your products and that you have something to offer for them as well. Um, now, I think the way that they went about it, <laughs> if, if I would have been the person to see the ad, I would say, hey, you can't do that. Um, because we live, in a, we live in a world of social media. So, you know, back in the day when you had a customer or a client that was angry with you, I called up a couple of my homegirls on the phone. I may have told my family and friends, but it didn't go too far. Now, almost everyone literally has at least a thousand followers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they may have in between, honestly, an average of three to five thousand people that follow them if they're on multiple social media networks. So when you express your disgust and you start getting these YouTube bloggers and people like this saying, this is a problem, and they're literally talking to hundreds of thousands of people at a time, you know, it magnifies people's feelings quickly um i feel and this is this is just my opinion if they would have run the exact same ad and they still could have included the white women if they would have had another two more sisters in there okay in addition to the one black woman they had in there and maybe highlighted some other skin tones for us because a lot of people felt some type of way because it was almost like you know that light bright they were talking about the type of hair that that woman had and there were so many other people said well I have 4C hair I have 4B and I've been using Shea Moisture and I remember standing in their hair shows waiting in lines for hours to buy their stuff before even they got to where they were this is literally what people were saying I feel like if they would have shown more representation of their base then it would have been more of, hey, let's have some new friends come over, right? We're expanding. And people would have been like, oh, my God, this is great that you guys, you know, that you guys are branching out to new areas and you have products that are, you know, healthy here for everyone. Um, When they only show that one lady and then one African-American woman and then you have, you know, multiple Caucasian women inside of the ad, it, I, and then you never show another African American woman with a different texture of hair either. Um, I feel like that's what made people feel slighted, and it was almost like my best friend just dumped me and went to a new crew of friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. of and that would upset a lot of people. So I think literally, if they would have added two more women of color in there with different textures of hair and different skin tones, I feel like that, and it literally could have been the same verbiage and everything. I think. I think that ad would have been perceived totally different because there would have been a representation of their core and of their base. And we know that African-American women, we come in all kinds of different shapes, sizes, and colors. We have all kinds of hair textures. Most of us have most, most of us that are natural, we have multiple hair textures inside of our hair. So if there would have been that type of representation, then it would have seemed more like inclusion instead of I'm kicking you to the curb because I want to get with them over here now. <laughs> so, how, how can they make it better? How can they make it better for going forward now since they didn't make that? They apologize. Is that enough? Um, I think I think they're on the first step by apologizing and acknowledging instead of doubling down and saying, hey, this was not our intent, but we're sorry that we made you feel this way. Um, I think if they become a little bit more inclusive in the process, um, you know, saying maybe doing some education and saying, you know, even on their social media and saying this type of this line or this set or this color of products is for people with this type of hair, but this is for those women with this type of hair. So I think educating people, 
Um, and I think really, you know, um, making sure in their future ads that they are showcasing their core. Um, I don't think that they have to abandon the Caucasian sisters at all. Um, but I just think it's important whenever you're running an ad, you're going to showcase your core demographic, and then you're also going to bring them in so that it's inclusionary instead of I just keep you to the curve, <laughs> which is how a lot of people, which is how a lot of people felt. I didn't feel that way because I'm a business owner. And I understood what they were trying to do. Um, but I definitely understood because the majority of the population are not business owners. The majority of the population, they don't understand investment, expansion. Um, they, don't, they don't understand those sorts of types of things. And so you have to be sensitive to people. It'd be like all of a sudden if I was like, OK, I'm going to work with large corporations and plan private programs for them. And I started running a bunch of ads that were only geared towards them. And I completely left out all of my small business owners, all of my startups, all of my moms. And I'll be honest, 73% of my audience is African-American. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I started posting images and I never showed another African-American person on one of my ads or my posts or inside of one of my video testimonials. People are going to feel some type of way about me. <laughs> so, it, like, I, li I literally think if they can, you know, start to showcase, you know, and maybe put together some other commercials and make sure whenever I'm running something, even though I'm trying to reach this new audience, I also need to make sure that I properly showcase my core and my base and the people that help me get to where I am right now. I think that they'll be fine. Okay. And the cycle is short. People, you know, next week they'll be mad about something else. <laughs> we do move I'm on quickly, don't we? Come on, quick. Last week, everybody was mad about Pepsi. You know what I mean? Right. By, by the time next week, you know, somebody will say something crazy that's a that's a politician. It'll be some scandal about some celebrity that came out. True. Some weird news come out, and everybody will forget. Yeah. So I think I think that they're already on the way to making it better by acknowledging it, putting out a public apologies on their social media, and in the future, you know, I think trying to educate different people with the lines and in your commercials. Just make sure um, there's e not even necessarily equal representation, but I, I do think it, it hurt the fact that you had one African-American woman and you had more white women, more Caucasian women than you had African-American women. Literally, if it would have been three African-American women in that ad and two Caucasian women and you showed different hair textures and skin tones on the African-American women, I don't think it would have been a problem. Yeah. I think everybody would be like, oh, this is great. And yeah. they're like, look, they're expanding. We're proud of them. I think it would have been received that way instead of they're trying to get rid of us for a dollar. Well, maybe Shea Moore should need to uh, hire you uh, for their next <laughs> media <laughs> campaign so they know to get it right. You know, let, let Ashley look at this first, please. Okay. They're, they're hiring. I help them out. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm available. laughs> well, you are, you are a, a co-author of a book that's coming out with Kim Coles. Yes. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so I am so excited about Open Your Gifts. First of all, Kim Coles is a wonderful person. You know how you meet some people and you're like, ew, they're not what I thought they would be? Mm -hmm. She's not like that at all. She's made up of like rainbows and unicorns and sunshine or something. She's just so, she's so incredible. Um, and so I was absolutely honored that, you know, she tapped me on the shoulder and gave me the opportunity to be a part of this project. And so the book literally is a compilation of, you know, 20, I think, I believe it's 23 of us, 23 women um, in our stories and different trials and tribulations that we've been through, mm -hmm. um, how we were able to pull ourselves out of those things. And then each of us give, you know, our life lesson, what we think that you should take away from this. Um, so that you really, you know, can move in, you know, gratitude and abundance and nice. all of that good stuff. Nice. And when is it going to be released? Um, I believe it's released during the month of May. Yeah. So I'm excited. You'll be able to get it on Amazon and you'll be able to get it at any Barnes and Noble store. Or, of course, you can go to my site. Click that, click that link on my Twitter. Yeah. Link. May, <laughs> May 10th. May 10th, I think it is. Yeah. I think it's dropping May 10th. Yeah. yeah. Open your gifts, get it. <laughs> now I have I have a lightning round that I do with all all my peoples, and uh, but before I do my lightning round, I have my final question because I can't be here with the guru and not get no uh, advice for Studio Q, Quincy. Give me, give, <laughs> I mean, give me something that I can pick up. Give me something that I can 
help help me give me a little just a little teak to take me in 20 the rest of 2017 hey this is what i would do for you guys because your interviews are phenomenal your personality is amazing um i noticed that you got the live streaming section on the website so i was like yes girl come through and live stream for the people because it because it is it, google has a prediction they think within five years 80 percent of content that's online is going to be video content so it's a, it's a it's a big deal and 85 percent of people will actually prefer to watch a live stream and to listen to someone than they do um than they prefer posting reading scrolling or looking through pictures and 90 percent of your listeners are more likely to share out when you're live streaming so keep up with the live streaming that's okay. going to be epic so when you're doing a red carpet or you got a cool interview if they give you permission live stream that sucker uh, okay. as well. And then the second thing I would tell you to do, well, two things, Facebook ads, of course, so that yes. way you can get you a new audience of followers. So all you got to do is put up a really cool interview and say, you know, you want to see more interviews, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, bada boom, bada bang. And then sponsored posts are going to be your friends. So reaching out to other people on like the Instagram platform or Pinterest or Periscope, working with them, doing past the cast, doing shout outs, um, you know, just changes or even if you want to run some ads if there's somebody and they got you know 300,000 people mm -hmm. um inside of their audience reach out to them do you do sponsor posts do you do ads hey i'm gonna put one here a video ad to promote and just have them you know go follow studio qtv nice and, and that will start to grow you expeditiously okay um, Wait, what is a sponsored ad where somebody, what is that? What is that? Yeah, it's, it's basically you pay for your post or for your shout out or whatever. Gotcha. Gotcha. And um, I do believe that micro influencers have a lot more power than some of your larger accounts. Um, unless you're a big account like the Shade Room, now they're huge, right? Yeah. yeah. And they, they got influence and they people are on it. They watch it, they look it, they click it, they yeah. come in and stuff like that. Um, but the Shade Room actually has real active followers. There are a lot of people on social media. You know, you go to their account and you're like, okay, you got 500,000 followers, but you just posted a picture and it only got 43 likes. What's up with that, right? Mm -hmm. That means either they purchase their followers or no one gives a flying thought about <laughs> And it's way that's not the place for you to be. Right. <laughs> so, you know, you know, compared to when they post, how many likes are they getting? How many comments are they getting? How many people are actually engaging with them? And if, it, if it's a good fit and their audience is your demographic and you want them to know about Studio Q, run your ad there with them. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Now for the lightning round. Okay, this just means one or the other. Quick, 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 quick. The question you are asked the most during live streaming. How do I make money? <laughs> <laughs> For you, early mornings or late nights, what's your preference? Oh, Jesus. I do them both. Uh, Just in life. Like, what, what, you know, do you like early, to do early, early morning, because in early morning, I can get more done with my day. Okay. When I sleep in, I feel like I'm, like, missing my life. Got you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we talked about this a little earlier. Shea Moisture or Pepsi, which one was worse? The Pepsi. Pepsi. Okay. Your response when broke people try to tell you how to spend your money. <laughs> I'll be like, when your bank account looks like mine, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> this, designing small, intimate events or big, lavish ones? Can I get small? Can I get small, lavish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be small, lavish. But small just small versus big, which one do you prefer? Small and lavish, because the um, the sense of love and adoration that is in a smaller event, because you're around people. You know, let, let's be honest. Nobody is friends with three or four hundred people. I don't care what you say. You may have three or four hundred associates, but I'm talking about when your back is up against the wall and you need somebody to call you and you need help. You, if you are a blessed person, if you got a handful of those people in your life. So I like small and lavish because those people are typically surrounded by the people who are really, truly their family and friends. Which is easier, helping men or helping women? Helping women. Yeah. Helping women. A lot of times men, um, it's an ego thing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of men, they even sometimes they don't even like the fact that my handle name is King Ashley. <laughs> uh, so helping women. Uh, we're very receptive. And women want to get things done. And a lot of women, um, 
you know, we're excited and we're being resilient. Um, Forbes released a study um, earlier in the year, and Black women are the largest growing group of entrepreneurs and small business owner, owners. So, yeah, helping women. We're hungry. We want it. I love it. Saying foe or four? Oh. <laughs> That is excellent. Well, I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to do the Studio Q interview. I mean, I'm going to break it up and put it out there for everybody to consume because you have been dropping a lot of great knowledge. And I just love that you are a female boss helping other women out here win. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. This is so much fun. And I'm so excited to be in the presence of another female boss. And so yeah. I'm breaking this all over. Oh, you know. thank you. Thank you. Well, like I so, said in the DM, down in the DM, it take one and no one. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Studio Q Show. Now you know.